Okay, we're going to roll right into this. Week 9, usually this is the finals week, but since we've just been doing quizzes every week, uh, I thought we'd just do one more quiz. I could get you a little bit more information. I know we skipped some things, and we've touched lighter than uh, we should have on several subjects, and that's just be because of the nature of this uh, online distance class. So thanks for watching this. I want to touch really quickly on three phase, and uh, I should probably set my timer right now because I'm probably going to run out of time on this one, but I would like you to watch... Uh, the full uh, one or two videos that I give on this three-phase because there's going to be some interesting stuff on uh, the, um, especially the, the um, high-leg uh, three-phase delta system. If you've ever encountered a three-phase panel that has a high-leg, I want to explain what's going on there and what the ramifications of that are. First of all, we should just talk about three-phase power a little bit. Now, the book Unit 27 has a very good example. Uh, it has some very good explanation of three-phase power. Essentially, we've talked about from the beginning, we're talking about alternating current. We're talking about a, a source of power that is derived by a rotational force. Something is turning something in circles. Either it's a water pushing through a hydroelectric or it's a nuclear power plant that's creating steam that's, that's turning a turbine. A windmill is just a turbine. Any of those sorts of things create power by spinning something. And what they do is they spin a conductor through a magnetic field. When that magnetic field uh, cuts across the conductor or the, cut, the conductor cuts across the magnetic field, either way works because it's just the relative motion between the two, we get power generated in a sinusoidal wave. If we model it, it goes high, it comes down low, it crosses zero, it goes the other direction. We talked about that. As I'm cutting across the lines of flux in one direction, I'm, I'm developing a voltage in one direction across these conductors. These, three, these wires that I've drawn here are, are loops of conductors spinning. And you've probably seen better representations of what that actually looks like in my little drawing. But instead of having just one set of conductors, a three-phase generator or any generation system that creates three-phase power has three sets of conductors. Each one is a loop of wire, and that loop of wire is spinning through that magnetic field in whatever way they've come up with to do that. Each one is a third of the circle out of phase with the others. Now, we know we divide a circle up into 360 degrees, so if I'm going to cut that into three pieces, that's 120 degrees each. So each of those lines of power, each of those sine waves, if we're, we're, we're uh, diagramming the voltage, each voltage sine wave is going to be 120 degrees out of phase with the other one. So when I say out of phase, it's just like we've been talking about with uh, leading and lagging of the, the voltage compared to the current in a uh, nonlinear load. And now, that's a word that I actually haven't used so far this term that I want to talk about a little bit, linear versus nonlinear. A nonlinear load is, is any load like we've been working on that has reactants in it, has capacitive reactants or inductive reactants. That's a little bit of an aside. Um, so it's very similar to that. A linear load is a load that uh, has no phase shift. Well, the three phase isn't, a, isn't uh, we don't break three phase into linear and nonlinear. We're just talking about three separate sources of power. And those three separate sources of power are run together down conductors that may or may not share points of that power in order to, to either run a transformer or run a load that takes three-phase power. We'll talk more about that. This is how it's generated. Usually these wires are then going to be connected to some sort of transformer. And a transformer can be built in, essentially a three-phase transformer can be built in two different flavors. The first one is a Y transformer. And let's see, let's draw it like a, a, an actual Y. If I come from the center, and that's the thing about a Y transformer, is it is center tapped. I'm going to try and draw my windings a little nicer this class than I have been and on the test. My art hasn't been too great. So if I was going to connect three phase up to this Y, I would connect, say, both ends of the red wire. I would connect maybe a red wire here and a red wire here, and I would have the voltage between. And then the blue wire there, I might share this connection point with the red and connect the other one to blue. And then with the blue and the green, and I would never use green, but that's the color marker I had because obviously green means ground, so I've never used a green conductor. But for my diagram, the green line is going to be connected with the blue and also to red. That's how I would connect that three-phase uh, uh, Y, and then I would ground the neutral point. Um, so essentially, I'm bringing out power to those things. Now, the Y connection is less likely to be used as the primary. So if this is my generation source, 
I'm probably not going to feed a Y. Let's talk about a delta instead. But you can see why that's called a Y, because it's kind of shaped like a Y. You'll see it spelled uh, uh, Y or W-Y-E. Either one of those is legit when we're talking about a Y configuration uh, for three-phase power. The more likely version you're going to see when you're talking about the primary, again, this is a power source. We're going to feed the primary of a transformer to then change the electrical voltage to something else we can use. We're either going to step it up to send it down some, some uh, lines to take it to wherever it's going to be used, or we're going to step it down at an actual uh, point of use. So a delta looks like this. It looks like the Greek letter delta which is their D, right? Put one more in there just to make it even. Again, my, my drawings aren't beautiful. But you, you can see that, again, I've got connection points here. I'm going to take the one that's uh, signified by my red lines, and I'm going to connect it out to one of these two coils. I'm going to take the green lines, and I'm going to connect it again, green we don't use, to another one of these. And then I'm going to take the blue and connect it to the third. You'll notice, because I've got six wires here, two per generating, generating loop that I'm using to generate, I'm going to have to connect two wires to each of these. Now in a one line drawing, you're not really going to see it look like that. You're going to see a single line, and they're going to label these L1, L2, and L3. But just know that's actually what's going on. Because in theory, these three loops of wire are not connected to each other until they're connected here. Now, in truth, this generation system may have some sort of junction where those wires come together and you only have one wire coming out each for lines one, two, and three. I'm going to throw away that marker and hopefully have another one that I can use. So let's talk about what happens in a... Uh, Delta and in a Y. Let's start out with Delta. Now I've got some great videos. I sent you a link to a list of videos uh, by a fellow who is a Canadian uh, electrical uh, engineering teacher. He teaches a class for electricians and he goes through Delta and Y connections. And he goes through, he, he talks about uh, um, Delta to Y transformers and Delta to Delta transformers and I think even Y to Delta Transformers, and that, that's the, the symbology he uses for those. Great stuff, and the, the things he talks about, I want to brush on really quickly here, and that is the difference between the voltages and the currents in the lines, that is the conductors that feed a transformer or are fed from a transformer, and the actual phase voltages and currents, that is to say, the, the internal coils and wiring inside a transformer. So there's, there, we make a distinction between those two, and you'll see why here in a second. Now, if I have a delta, I'm going to draw that again, try and draw it a little nicer this time. If I have a delta connected, uh, let's say it's the primary. Really doesn't matter for this exercise. But I have three coils that I'm hooking up, and I'm going to hook them up to this power, and I'm going to put a voltage across them that's generated by this thing, and that voltage, since it's a closed loop, is going to push current through, since there's some load on these coils, because those coils also have a secondary. Each one of these three coils is sharing a, uh, a, a, another space with another coil. It's sharing a core with another coil, which is the secondary, and we're, we're taking the voltage put on these with the turns ratio, just like we saw, we saw in single phase transformers, and we are pushing a voltage across a different voltage across the secondary coils. But that's what this is. This is showing the three coils on the primary side, which is, is, is shot from this. So if I draw the wires coming out, and I just talked about how those are hooked up, line one, line two, and line three, and again, I'm pushing power into this. I'm generating power here at my generator, and I'm pushing power into my delta. I'm going to have some voltages here that I can measure. I can measure voltage between these two wires, these two conductors, and that's going to be my line voltage. Same thing, I can measure my voltage between here and here. That's a line voltage. I can also measure the voltage. I don't know how 
I'm going to do it here, come down here and skip that guy there to here. And this is also a line voltage. Now normally you're going to see those are all going to be the same voltage because I'm producing it from the same generator and they're spinning through the same magnetic uh, field, so they're going to produce the same thing. Uh, so I've got, if we call these, uh, let's see, A, B, and C, I'm going to have a voltage between A and B that should be equal to the voltage between B and C that's also equal to the voltage between B and A. And those are called my line voltages in this case when I'm measuring them from the wires. Now, you can see that this is kind of like a parallel system. It's not exactly a parallel system because I've got three things with three connections. But you can see our rules of series and parallel, how do I know if it's a series circuit? Well, I know there's only one uh, route for the current to go. There is only one current path. So if I'm pushing current into this, this is explained really well, better than I'm going to do in that video from the fellow with the video list if you want to watch it. I'm going to push the current into here. My current has two places to go. So essentially, I've got uh, a voltage, excuse me, I've got a current divider, which means that my voltage is the same. So in a delta, a delta connected circuit, line voltage, I'm not sure why I'm doing such a terrible job of drawing today, line voltage equals phase voltage. Just like voltage on any parallel system is the same. So the voltage on the two lines, since they're connected straight up to the coil, the difference between here and here is zero. There is no difference between this point and this point and this point and this point. So if I measure at the conductors or I measure at the coil, it's the same. However, current, there is a change. If I push some current into this system, that current gets to go two different directions. But because these guys are 120 degrees out of phase with each other, it doesn't just divide up like it would say in a true parallel circuit with just linear loads, with just resistors or just even DC. I have to consider these things 120 degrees out of phase. And it turns out, without going into a lot of the vector math, that if I take a circle and split it into three pieces, those 120 degree angles between those mean that the vector differences between this vector and this vector, rather than being that Pythagorean relationship that we've been talking about with 90 degrees, when it's 120 degrees out of phase, the vector relationship is a square root of three relationship. Or as one of the videos, the guy just calls it root three. Square root of three, and if you calculate that square root of three number, you get 1.732, I think, in change. I like to use the square root of three in my calculator. If you want to memorize this number and use that, you can. But either way, that's the relationship between the currents, between these two things. So what I actually get for current, since I've got some current here and I get it divided up, I'm going to have less current at each phase. The phase current is going to be less than the line current. And the, how much less it is, it's divided by the square root of three. So I line divided by the square root of, I don't know why I can't do square roots, square root of 3 equals I at the phase. Now remember, the phase voltages and the phase currents are what's happening inside of this unit. The fellow, the Canadian that I was watching those videos and had shared them with you, I really like how he explains that. It's my interior currents and my interior voltages rather than my exterior currents and exterior voltages. I've always thought of it as, hey, my voltages and my currents on my conductors, my actual wire feeding it, versus my currents and voltages inside the transformer on the actual phases, actually inside and outside was not a way I thought of it before, but as soon as I saw him talking about it that way, it made perfect sense to me. So I'll pass that on to you. So it's a square root of three relationship. Now, we aren't going to worry about this too much as electricians. Unless you are designing systems for transformers, um, it's enough for you to understand that the current on the line is different than the current on the phase. As an electrician, you're going to use the current on the line and the voltage on the line. When we consider the voltage of a system, we're considering the line voltage of that system, with one small exception to that, and that's that, that, that neutral derived in a Y system, which we'll talk about in a second. But for our purposes, 
When you're calculating power, because the fellow goes on to explain, and the book goes on to explain, um, P is always equals I times E, but in this case, it's I times E times the square root of 3. I encourage you, when using this square root of 3 in this calculation and others you're going to do, that you always just tie it to the voltage. It's my three-phase voltage. When we talk about uh, uh, services that are three-phase, we talk about what their voltage is. So we say, I've got a 483 phase delta. I've got a, a 208 a three phase Y. I'm always going to talk about the voltage in, in conjunction with three phase. And if I always tag that three square root of three onto my voltage, my calculations will always come out. Whether I'm trying to figure out power or whether I'm trying to figure out current, because the current equals power divided by E times the square root of three, right? E, it's, it's I equals P divided by E. If I'm using Ohm's law and I've got a three phase, I'm also going to use the square root of three. Less likely that I'm going to worry about Ohm's law. I'm going to mostly be dealing with Watt's law and wattage and uh, uh, power calculations with this. So that is a messy drawing, and I apologize. Take away from this, delta looks like a current divider, it looks like a parallel circuit, therefore the voltages are the same. My line voltage and my phase voltage is the same in the delta. My current in the phase is less than my current in the line, and it's less by a ratio of square root of 3. Divided by square root of 3, I get a smaller current on this phase. Because some of it goes this way, some of it goes that way, and that's happening at all three ends at, at the same time. And again, I've got those three things 120 degrees out of phase with each other, so they're working at slightly different times in our time domain. Uh, the fella in the video goes into a little bit more vector math than we do, but I think he does a good, good uh, a job of explaining that stuff. Let's look at a Y connection straight off the train. Or actually, we'll use the Y connection as though it was the secondary. Say that was my primary. Now I'm going to build myself. A Y, let's see how poorly I can draw this one. So here is a Y connected transformer. Now, again, with these transformers, if this is the secondary, that delta I just drew and erased, and it was the primary, this coil would share a core with one of the three corners of the delta, with one of the three sides of the delta. This coil would share a core with one of the others, and this would share a core with the third one also. That's the only connection those two things have together. And it's just by force of, of, of the induction, because of those coils with a proximity and sharing a core, that we can put a voltage on these coils. Um, so this guy would get all of, its, all of its voltage from here to here, because this is the thing that shares that other coil in the delta. Right? This was the delta. This is one of the three of the delta. This is the, the other three of the delta. And this is the third of the delta. Put those three together in a triangle and hook them up the way we did, and that's what's going on. But that's where the actual magnetism is happening, expanding and contracting on the one coil and uh, basically energizing the other, inducing a voltage on the other. So keep that in mind. That's what's going on. Now, if I think about my currents and my voltages on this, Again, I'm going to have I'm going to draw three lines, but let's go let's show them go in the other direction, right? Because now these are going out to the world, and they're going to feed a PAM or a service or some load. You know, by the way, there's going to be some overcurrent protection in the way. There's going to be some uh, grounding and bonding going on. All the other code stuff we do, but just for theory, this is what is going to be supplying our power down the way. Now, on this particular one, I can measure. The line voltage. I put my meter here, I put my meter here, I get a voltage. I put my meter here, my meter here, I get a voltage. I connect my meter here and up here on the line, I get a third voltage. Now those voltages should again all be the same because they're derived from a, the, the single set of primary coils that are all getting their power from the same generator. So they're going to be the same voltage as each other. However, when I measure that line voltage, say from here to here, let's call this uh, A, B, C, just for fun. If I'm figuring out what the line voltage is, so voltage line of A to B, 
Because remember, a voltage is just the difference between two spots, two locations. The low, well, let's go C, A to C, because that's what I'm looking at here. Line voltage between A to C, that's this voltage here. Now that voltage there obviously can't, and we're going to call this neutral, right? And we're going to send a line out to the world for neutral. Um, the, dip, the voltage between here and here, this is what actually gets its induction from the primary coil. Because this is the way the primary coil is hooked up between here and here. So this voltage, which is going to be voltage phase, and that's going to be from C to neutral, that obviously can't be the same as this whole voltage, right? But remember, the sine wave that I measure on this coil and the sine wave I measure on this coil, those are 120 degrees out of phase with each other. So it's not like I've just taken these two and hooked them up and I just have more coils and therefore a larger voltage. I can't just add this voltage and this voltage. I actually have to do some math. Let's say for Grins, because it's a really common one, that the voltage between C and A is 480 volts. And this is a Y. So that same square root of 3 relationship works in voltages. This Y is kind of like a series circuit, isn't it? If I have some current that is coming out of this guy, this direction, I have current coming out this way, heading toward my source, current coming out this way. All of the current that goes through the coil gets to this node and has no choice but to keep going. So I is going to be equal. So I phase in a Y equals uh, I line in a Y. In a Y, the phase, the current at the phase, and the current at the line are the same. There's nowhere else for that current to go that goes through the phase to the line. However, the voltage is not the same. This voltage obviously can't equal this voltage. Since these two things are 120 degrees out of phase with each other, the relationship between them is that square root of 3 relationship. Just like everything we did with 90 degree relationships, we used Pythagorean to solve. Everything we do with 120 degree relationships uses the square root of 3 to solve. So my voltage difference is, my voltage A to C is my line voltage, my voltage phase equals my voltage line divided by the square root of 3. Now if you dump 480 divided by the square root of 3 into your calculator, you're going to get a number very close to 277 volts. Now has anybody ever dealt with 277 volts in this class? Probably. Because 277 volts is one of the standard single phase voltages, one of the standard, I should say, single pole voltages, a voltage that you can protect with just a hot. Because in order to get that 277 volts, I bring my neutral and one of my hots out to a load. Now I'm going to overcurrent protect it, but I'm only going to overcurrent protect the hot, right? Because my neutral is my ground. My neutral is at my ground potential. My neutral is not my ground. My, ground. my neutral is at my ground potential, so I don't need to have an overcurrent protection on that. In fact, the code precludes us from switching, including with overcurrent protection, neutral wires. So 277 is a good uh, voltage for lighting, uh, mostly, and it is a nice voltage in that I can take it off of a 480 volt circuit, a 480 volt system, that I can still use three phase. I can still bring these three legs out and have power of a three phase 480 volt load. As long as my line voltage, the wire between here and here has 480 volts and I have three of those phases, I can power any load. I can power another delta load. Say I've got a piece of equipment that has three big resistors in it. It's an oven or it's something that, that melts aluminum. It's an aluminum smelter or some huge heat producing load piece of equipment that I want to hook up and its nameplate says, hey, I need 480 volts and it has to be three phase. I could use this Y to run that. Even if its loads are connected in delta. If I opened up the piece of equipment, here's my big heater of, or furnace or oven or whatever it is, and inside that thing I found out that I had uh, three, and I won't even draw them like that, I'll draw them like resistors. I have three resistors hooked up in delta, 
as long as this resistor is looking for 480 volts, this resistor is looking for 480 volts, this resistor is looking for 480 volts, I can bring those three hot wires out to it, heat up that load. I'm just fine. So the takeaway from the delta and from the Y is that the opposite of the delta. The Y, your current is the same in the phase as it is in the line. Your voltage, however, is going to be different. And we use that to our advantage when we center tap and derive a neutral. Because remember, this neutral didn't come from my primary. My primary only had three wires. I'm going to derive a neutral by grounding the system at that center tap point. And then I'm going to run a wire out to my loads and call it my neutral. And that's going to be my, my current carry conductor that is grounded, my grounded conductor. We're going to talk about that more in, in single phase 240 stuff that you guys have probably seen already, but this is the way it works in a Y. Um, and we're also going to talk about what we do in our secondaries at delta, and we need a neutral, and how uh, the different ways that that can be accomplished. But the takeaway from this is that your line voltages um, are different in a Y, and in a delta your line currents are different than the phase current. Um, as electricians, once you understand this, and you understand that except inside the transformer and inside your loads, and for this one variance where we're using a neutral, all I have to worry about is my line voltages and my line currents. I'm never going to try and, and size a conductor using my phase. Obviously, you can. There is a formula that allows you to do it. Um, but I'm never going to size my conductors using my phase voltage. I'm going to use size my conductors, which is what we as electricians do, and size my circuits, size my overcurrent devices, based on the line loads, the line current and the line voltage, and the power that I get from using line voltage and line current. And I have to use that square root of three to do that. So we're going to go over some of those calculations. So this stuff won't be on the quiz. Let's get to the stuff that will be on the quiz. Let's see how much time I've used up already. Uh, I have two minutes left. So I'm going to stop this video and we're going to get to the next video. And I promise that it's the stuff that you're actually going to need to use. But it's important to have this part uh, understood before we get there.